All right, we got the go signal here. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, glad that you're here with us. Uh, just got a good update. I don't know how many of you have had a chance to check your email uh, since last night, but um, Dan Daggett just let me know. I sent out an email Friday and I had the name wrong. <laughs> I don't know if you guys knew that. But Heather, Dan's wife, so Dan's father in law, has uh, been in uh, Boise in ICU with COVID over in Bend. And Friday it was looking real touch and go like he was, like maybe he wasn't going to make it. And now uh, things are really taking a turn for the better. And so uh, no ventilator, and he's really improved. And it looks like he's going to maybe get to go home in a couple of days. So. A big answer to prayer, uh, continue to pray for him, but praise God, um, and so we're grateful for that. So thanks for the update, you guys, and uh, happy for you. A um, couple things, um, announcement-wise, I want to let you know about. Uh, one, uh, we haven't said, don't say a lot about this, but Point Man, our, uh, our men's Bible study, uh, meets every two weeks, Wednesday night at 7, and so just that's an invite that's open to any of the men in the church that want to come. Uh, we've just started a kind of a new transition to a new kind of um, finished one study and we're on to a next one and we're working on some Bible study skills and we're working on the book of Jonah together and uh, we had a fantastic Wednesday, a couple Wednesdays ago. It just felt like the Holy Spirit did a great thing and it was really neat dynamic amongst our guys. So we meet this Wednesday, so guys, you're welcome, 7 o'clock here on Wednesday night. Uh, other thing is, uh, next Sunday is the first Sunday of May, and the elders have been talking, and we said we should get the dinner on the grounds going again. We should have our fellowship meal noon on Sunday. We're gonna, so we're, you, you can bring food, but we'll serve it. We'll do like the cafeteria line, and we'll figure out how to get that set up, so it won't be the big potluck with everybody dipping in, but... Uh, if you can bring something, that would be great. Uh, a dish, a salad, a main dish, a salad, a dessert, whatever. And then we'll get a cafeteria line and we'll meet here at noon and enjoy a fellowship meal together. And uh, we felt like it's time to get the ball rolling on that again. So um, yesterday I did, I sat in our little, by the creek in this little playhouse that we built and I was doing my Bible reading, listening to the creek. And I'm reading through Hebrews, Mark, and I came to uh, this verse, if you put it up there, Dara, about Jesus who is able to save to the uttermost those who draw near to God through Him, since He always lives to make intercession for them. So, those, how do you draw near to God? How do you come into His presence in a personal relationship it's through Jesus we draw near through Him, our great high priest who has offered a sacrifice of Himself so that we can enter into the presence of a holy God. And He is there making intercession for us so we can go with confidence before God. And so if you need to draw near to God, there's one way to do that, and that's through Jesus Christ. And so what we want to do as we sing is draw near to Him in, in song and worship Him through Christ our Savior. So... Um, Daniel, if you and your team, the musicians will come up, I'll offer a word of prayer, and then we'll sing to the Lord. So Lord, we, uh, we give praise to you, Lord God, today. We thank you for your Son who uh, brings us before you. Without Him, uh, we cannot uh, enter into your presence. Without Him, there is no fellowship with you. But through Him, Lord, we can come boldly before your throne of grace with confidence. Thank you for for making a way for us to draw near to you, Lord, that you are awesome and mighty and also personal. And then, Lord, thank you for uh, the answers to prayer and the improvement um, for Heather's dad. We are so grateful. Uh, we just give you praise, God, that you are our healer and that you care about all of these details and you know all these things. Um, so we thank you for that answered prayer. Uh, now as we sing, Lord, may we do it with our whole heart, uh, giving glory to you that you deserve. We do it through Christ again. Amen. Go ahead and stand with us. We're going to, like Brock said, lift our voices in, in praise of God. Uh, wonderful grace of Jesus. We're going to start out with that one. Wonderful 
grace of Jesus, greater than all my sin. How shall my tongue describe it? Where shall its praise begin? Taking away my burden, setting the Spirit free for the wonderful grace of Jesus. Reaches me, wonderful the matchless grace of Jesus, deeper than the mighty rolling sea, higher than the mountains, like a mountain, a sufficient grace for even me, brighter than the scope of my transgression, greater far than all my sin and shame. Oh, magnify the precious name of Jesus, praise His name. Wonderful grace of Jesus, reaching to all the lost. By it I have been pardoned, saved to the uttermost. Chains have been torn asunder, giving me liberty. The wonderful grace of Jesus reaches me. Wonderful the matchless grace of Jesus. Deeper than the mighty rolling sea. Higher than the mountains. Like a fountain. All sufficient grace for even me. The scope of my transgression. The pardon of my sin and shame. Oh, magnify the precious name of Jesus, praise His name. Wonderful grace of Jesus, reaching the most divine. By His power, making Him God's dear child. Purchase in peace and heaven for all eternity. For the wonderful grace of Jesus reaches me. Wonderful the matchless grace of Jesus, deeper than the mighty rolling sea. Higher than the mountains, like a fountain, all sufficient grace for even me. Higher than the scope of my transgression, higher than all my sin and shame. Oh, magnify the precious name of Jesus, praise His name. Well done. That's a, a mouthful at times. You may be seated. I was uh, listening on the radio um, this last week, and uh, there was a discussion going on about uh, worship music and uh, the types of songs we sing, and the comparison between uh, hymns from 100 years ago to songs of today, and just what they focused on, and it seemed to be a a trend, not totally, but uh, kind of a a trend of older songs tend to focus on characteristics of God and magnifying what he has done in his name, and then moving into a, a generalization of songs of today is more focused on our heart and how we, we sing um, and how we live in relationship to God. And I was thinking, there's not a right or a wrong. If we're singing to God, we want to have a great picture of who he is and what he has done for us. But if we are, we also want to focus on our heart and where it is in relationship to how we sing and how we worship him. And so if we can kind of take both of those and put them into our worship and our our view and our our praise of God, that's what we want to do. We want to take both and put them Put them out there so God can hear a, a sweet sound coming from us. Um, 
this next song is kind of leaning towards our position. Um, so it's called Holy Water, and let's sing that together.
holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. With all creation I sing praise to the King of Kings. You are my everything, and I will adore you. rainbows of living color, flashes of lightning, rolls of thunder, blessing and honor, strength and glory and power be to you, the only wise King. Holy, holy. is and is to come. With all creation I sing praise to the King of Kings. You are my everything and I will adore you. With wonder, awestruck wonder, at the mention of your name. Jesus, your name is power, breath and living water, such a marvelous mystery. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. With all creation I sing praise to the King of Kings. You are my everything, and I will adore you. God, we do adore you because you are holy and you are worthy. You are God above all, and we praise you and we thank you for that. We thank you for all that you have done for us, all of who you are, and God, you are going to be doing so much more. God, we love you and we worship you. Amen. Thank you guys, that was good stuff. Did you uh, catch that on the first song, Save to the Uttermost? Did you notice that? We did not plan that. I thought, I whispered, whispered to my wife, oh, isn't that cool? Uh, totally unplanned. Well, here's, here's something I did try and plan. Have you, have you ever tried uh, to plan a surprise uh, and have it not work out like you planned? Surprise birthday party, a surprise whatever, and it just didn't quite unfold like you envisioned. So, uh, here's a story about that. So, my wife and I, we met on the track at Eastern, Heidi and I, and uh, what year was that? 2011, so I was 35 years old, and we walked, the, we walked laps up at Eastern. 
first meeting, trying to get to know each other. Uh, and uh, after it was over, uh, she gave me a hug, found her, and later thought, I just hugged this strange guy. And I, I asked her, hey, do you want to do this again? And afterward I thought, I didn't even pray about that. And so we, we started dating, courting, and about a month into the thing, uh, we were talking on the phone, and, and this had been going through my mind, and I, I, I thought, okay, I'm just going to say it. I'm going to just, I don't know if I should say this. I'm going to go ahead. I'm going to say it. I said, I think I love you. Is that crazy? Is it possible to really love somebody after only a month? I mean, isn't that just infatuation? Is that really, you know, I'm like debating this for myself. And she says, I love you too. I've been waiting for you to say it. I thought, okay, I guess that's, women tend to be a little, you know, the matters of the heart and us guys are a little, and I'm kind of analytical. So uh, a, that's a month in. <clears throat> At the five month mark, it's Thanksgiving rolls around. And I go to her parents for Thanksgiving, and I ask her dad um, for her, his blessing. Do I have your blessing? I'd like to ask your daughter to marry me. And he said, yeah, absolutely. Um, and so we commissioned, the day after Thanksgiving, we went to Joseph, and we commissioned the jeweler up there to make a ring. Um, Heidi's mom had torn a picture out of a magazine one time and uh, of a ring Heidi liked, and so the stone in the middle was her... Isn't that right, babe? Gigi's, her great-grandma Scotty's from Scotland. And so we commissioned this ring to be made day after Thanksgiving. And this is going to be the ring I have when I hit the knee and pop the question. And so December rolls by, and January, and we're like halfway through January. So it's been like almost two months, and I'm like, like, ring, when's this ring going to get done so I can do the thing, and finally it's like, man, this thing's never going to get ready. Like, I'm just going to have to do it. So her mom made this little um, embroidery thread fabric ring that I'm going to use because I can't wait any longer. We're going to, we need to do this. And uh, so I plan how I'm going to, how this is going to happen. Here's where the plan comes in. Uh, I made a plan with her parents. I need you to get her out of the house in Enterprise just make up something for such and such a time. And I'm, while she's out, I'm going to sneak in. And so that went fine. She goes out. I sneak in, and I had all these candles ready to go. And I lit these candles, and I had these little scripture cards that I would written that were about like marriage or a wife, uh, things like um, he who finds a good thing, uh, finds a wife, finds a good thing, and obtains favor from the Lord or uh, from Ruth. All the townspeople know that you're a worthy woman, or another one from Proverbs, uh, an excellent wife is more precious than jewels, you know, and so, and it's supposed to lead her through the house, starting in like the kitchen to the living room and up the stairs to the bedroom where I'm hiding in the closet. And she's going to, and then I'm going to come out of the closet, you know, and, and do it, right? One problem. I forgot about the dog. <laughs> this is Pippin. This was the dog Heidi and the kids had. She's my mom's dog now. So I can't remember if Pippin went out with her in the car. And so I hear, I'm up in the closet. I got it all set up and it's ready to go. And I hear the door open and her come in. And I'm like, yes. And then I hear the up the stairs. And I'm like, Oh no, Pippin, and she's coming right for me. <laughs> and so she makes a beeline up the stairs, and there she is. There, and like I'm kind of got the door partway closed. I'm like, oh, I pray she doesn't know, Lord, or not. Sure enough, here's her little nose. And I'm like, Pippin, get out of here. You know, I'm trying not to be loud, but like, get out of here. Like, and so Heidi, I think she, she stopped at some of the waypoints, but it was kind of like, it didn't have the effect and the dramatic buildup that I wanted it to. And I just picture her coming in the room, and here's Pippin's butt sticking out of the closet. I wonder who's in there and what's going on. So she comes in there, and I kind of go, hey. 
<laughs> you know, kind of defeated. The dog kind of ruined this. But I love you, will you marry me? And I put the little cloth thing on there. And she said, yes, you know, and it, I knew that was okay. But it worked out, it was fine, it was good, but it didn't quite roll out like I envisioned. The plan didn't quite go perfectly how I thought I wanted it to. So, um, surprising plan, tried to plan a surprise, didn't succeed in every detail, but God is not like that. He makes surprising plans, but His plans do succeed in every detail. They never fail to succeed. Now think about the surprising things God does in the Bible. Uh, it's kind of amazing if you start to think about it. He does some weird, unusual things. So Abraham and Sarah, they're old. And he makes a promise, you're going to have a baby. She's infertile. She's barren. Children. 25 years go by and finally Isaac arrives. Abraham's 100 years old. Sarah's 90. That's a weird plan, right? That's a surprising thing. But it succeeded because it's God's plan. Uh, he told Abraham, after he called him, that they were going to be slaves in Egypt. His offspring is going to be slaves in Egypt for 400 years. So the sovereign God who's over everything, that was built into the plan. I mean, that's an odd plan to choose a man named Abraham and, and, and call out a people for himself, but, but let him know, hey, by the way, you got 400 years of slavery coming down the line. That's, that's an odd thing. The way it, it rolled out and the way he got him there, that was a surprising plan. Uh, Joseph, one of the sons of Jacob of Israel, is given these dreams, and he's his daddy's favorite, who's got the multicolored coat, and he's bragging to his brothers about the dreams God gave him, about them bowing down to him, and because of their jealousy, he gets thrown in a well, and then they sell him in slavery to Egypt, and he's taken down to Egypt. And then a famine comes years later, and it's that means that gets the people of Israel to Egypt to start with, delivers them from famine, but that's where the slavery happens, that they're slaves for 400 years. That's a surprising, unusual plan. Um, then there's the plan that after those 400 years, God's going to get glory over Pharaoh and over Egypt, and it culminates in the Passover, and it culminates in this showdown at the Red Sea where they're backed up against the sea and Pharaoh's armies go forward and the sea parts and Pharaoh's army tries to follow and the sea drowns them. Strange, surprising plan that succeeds. Later on, they're headed to the promised land and there's a Canaanite prostitute named Rahab in whose heart God works so that she believes and fears God and shelters spies, and she is in the genealogy of Jesus, a Canaanite prostitute. That's a surprising plan. Uh, David, the plan to choose David as king. He sends the prophet Samuel, God does, says go down there to, the, to Jesse and his sons, and the, the sons parade one by one before Samuel the prophet. Samuel's like, well, the oldest, he's impressive. Surely it's this one that God has chosen. And on down the line, nope, 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 nope. It's a surprise, big surprise to everyone, to, to the brothers, to Jesse the father, to Samuel the prophet, when it's David, the little one, the youngest one out there tending sheep. He's the guy God has chosen. Um, this is a surprising guy to choose as a, as a spokesperson. John the Baptist, here's this wild-eyed, wild man out in the desert with, dressed in camel hair, eating locusts and wild honey. And that's the guy who's going to announce that the Messiah is on the scene, that, that the Christ is here. Is that the guy you'd choose? A guy like that out in the desert somewhere? That's a surprising choice and plan. The virgin birth. Another example. That's an unusual idea that... Way back, 700 years before Christ, prophet Isaiah prophesies a virgin's going to give birth, and that's how God brings His Son, the Christ, into the world, how Jesus comes into the world. Then there's the selection of the disciples. You think about who these guys were? 
Jesus spends all night in prayer, and this is the team. You know, I was thinking about the schoolyard, right, and recess and stuff like that, and like everybody lines out, and you got two captains, and you're picking teams. And who are the guys Jesus picks? Like, if Jesus is picking teams, uh, fishermen, it's not the rabbis, it's not the scholars, it's not the teachers of the law, it's not the religious mucky mucks with all the training. I'm taking fishermen, uh, Matthew, the tax collector, so a turncoat, a traitor to the Jewish people who's getting rich, working for the Romans. Uh, Simon the Zealot is selected. The Zealots were people, Jewish people who, they hated the Romans. And if they had a chance, a Roman by themselves and could knife a Roman and kind of dump him on the side of the road and nobody would be the wiser, they'd do it. They, they, they were for uh, armed rebellion and it, violence against the Romans. And so this is the team Jesus assembles. You got a tax collector who's a traitor working for the Romans and you got a zealot who wants to knife Romans and you got fishermen and everybody in between. That's a surprising deal. Uh, it got me thinking. <laughs> so he puts these guys together and like, okay, you're going to learn to love each other and get along now. Right? So I thought back to high school days. Early 90s was high school for me. And uh, in high school, I was like the 4.0 nerd kid who carried all his bags in this giant book bag. And I wore polo shirts. You know, I kind of like the golf shirts. Short sleeve golf shirts with a collar, but I buttoned the top button. And I wore cargo pants. So I had like three pairs of cargo pants and like six or eight button-up polo shirts, and that's what I wore every day. I cycled through that. I tried to wear, like, Wranglers, but they're so dang tight, and they ride up in the crotch, you know, and, and I couldn't do it because I couldn't move. So I went with the cargo pants and the button-up polo. So if Jesus is picking a team, you pick the nerd with the, the polo shirt, and then in, in the early 90s and late 80s, and so the skaters, remember the skate, skating was big and the, you had the kids with the, you know, the long hair and the pants that hung down here and all that. That was coming in. There were a bunch of them in our high school. So Jesus would pick the nerd kid with the button-up polo shirt. He'd pick a skater. And then he'd pick like um, sort of the classic Eastern Oregon redneck kid who had like the six-inch lift on their Chevy short bed pickup and a gun rack in the back with like your aught six back there. Remember in the days when you could, nobody locked their truck, and you just had a rifle back there in the gun rack, and it was no big deal, and it was fine? Before, I mean, those days are long gone, aren't they? Those are the kind of guys Jesus would pick. Those are the kind of surprising things he would do. Okay, so, the Lord, cowboys do this too, though, maybe I'd the Lord makes a lot of surprising plans, and He ensures they succeed, though. So, what we're going to do today is we're going to look at an instance of that. And I'm going to do something that's kind of unusual, maybe, or a little bit surprising. I'm actually going backward in the book of Acts. Normally, we kind of work sequentially. I'm actually going backward to do this, and the reason I'm doing this is because this is going to be our last sermon in Acts, and we're going to transition, and we're going to preach four in the book of Jonah, which is why our men's group was doing that. And Jonah is another book that's all about these surprises, that God takes an Israelite, a Jewish man, and he stops him in his tracks. The word of the Lord comes to him, and he says, go to Nineveh, go to this city of the Assyrians, this great city. The Assyrians were enemies of Israel. They were kind of the bully on the block, who, who were brutal to people and had mistreated the Israelites. And God sends a prophet to those people to warn them of judgment, to give them a chance to repent and turn from their sin. Jonah hates it, wants to run from God because this is such a shocking surprise that God would even offer mercy to people like that. So that's a book that's all about surprises. And so I thought, I'm going to go back to one in Acts that's sort of a bridge to Jonah that's about God making a surprising plan that he guarantees the success of. Okay, so... Where, where is this? That's a long lead-in. It's Acts chapter 18. So that's where we're going to look today. Acts 18. Uh, verse 1 says, um, 
Acts 18.1, after this, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth. So that's the setting. He's in the city of Corinth. I'm going to pick up in verse 5. So he's there in Corinth, and verse 5 of chapter 18 says, When Silas and Timothy arrived from Macedonia, Paul was occupied with the word testifying to the Jews that the Christ was Jesus. And when they opposed and reviled him, he shook out his garments and said to them, Your blood be on your own heads. I am innocent. From now on I will go to the Gentiles. And he left there and went to the house of a man named Titius Justus, a worshiper of God. His house was next door to the synagogue. Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue, believed in the Lord, together with his entire household. And many of the Corinthians, hearing Paul, believed and were baptized. Verse 9 now. And the Lord said to Paul one night in a vision, Do not be afraid, but go on speaking, and do not be silent. For I am with you, and no one will attack you to harm you. For I have many in this city who are my people. I have many in this city who are my people. So he's in Corinth. Paul is, and Jesus one night appears to him in a vision with these promises that he gives him. And one of these promises, one of the things he tells Paul is that he has many, Jesus already has many in the, peop, in the city who are his people. So, uh, Jesus has, God has earmarked some Corinthians who are his. These people have not yet heard about Jesus. They've not yet believed in Jesus. And yet, the Jesus ear tag is already in their ear. They just haven't been called into the pen yet. That's what he's saying. I have many in the city who are my people. But they haven't yet heard about Christ yet. Now, what is, what's surprising about that? Why is that a surprising thing? Well, the surprising thing is, if you, is who the Corinthians were. The Corinthians were a messy bunch. They were kind of a... If you know your Bible, you know the Corinthian church was not like the stellar church of the New Testament. So, a sample of 1 Corinthians shows us the, the myriad of problems this group had that God had earmarked as His. So, in chapter 3, Paul writes to them, there's bickering, there's infighting going on. He said, that while there's jealousy and strife among you, Aren't you behaving in a fleshly, merely human way? This is not the way of Christ. One says, I follow Paul. And another says, I follow Apollos. Aren't you be, are you not being merely human? So they're like, I've got my favorite, my favorite teacher, and I associate with him, and there's a bunch of this bickering and infighting going on. So they've got, that's, that's what was going on amongst this church, among these people. In chapter 5 of the letter, there's sexual immorality happening there. Paul says, it's actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you and of a kind that is not tolerated even among the pagans for a man has his father's wife. Evidently a guy sleeping with his mother, uh, mother-in-law, his stepmom. I mean, stepmom, I mean. And you are arrogant. Ought you not rather to mourn? So they seem to be proud about their tolerance of this kind of immorality that even the pagans didn't tolerate. In chapter 6, they're suing one another. Brother goes to law against brother and that before unbelievers. To have lawsuits at all with one another is already defeat for you. Why not rather suffer wrong? Why not rather be defrauded? But you yourselves wrong and defraud even your own brothers. So they're suing each other in court. In chapter 11, at the Lord's Supper, there's people pigging out and people getting drunk. Can you imagine communion? I mean, in the early church, that was a meal, uh, the Lord's Supper, the Lord's Table. And apparently, he says, when you come together, it's not the Lord's Supper that you eat. Like, whatever you're doing, that ain't the Lord's Supper because of how you're doing it. In eating, each one goes ahead with his own meal. One goes hungry, another gets drunk. And Paul's incredulous, like, what? What are you doing? And you get the sense, like, there's the meal, like maybe there's a buffet line and somebody's loading up their plate. So the guy down the line, is, he's got like nothing to choose from and he's starving and here's this guy with this mound on his plate 
And people are getting drunk on the wine at the Lord's Supper. It's like, what are you doing? Uh, in, in chapter 13, I mean, there's pride about spiritual gifts going on, which is why that whole love chapter, you know, that is so famous. They, you know, they're big on the sign gifts. If I speak of men and angels, Paul says, but I have, if I don't have love, I'm just a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I have all these prophetic powers, but I have not love, I'm, I'm nothing. So they had that going on in chapter 15. There's people denying the resurrection among them. If Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say there's no resurrection of the dead? So there's a church with all these issues. These are the people that Jesus appears to Paul one night in a vision and says, before they're yet in the church, I've got many in this city who are my people. If you're Paul, you're like, thanks Lord for giving me that crowd to shepherd, right? Like, but he's got the ear tag in the ear. That's a surprising choice. Paul wrote to them in chapter 1 and he says basically this, he says, um, you know, in and of yourselves, you guys aren't all that special. Uh, Consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you who were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even the things that are not, to bring to nothing the things that are, so that no human being might boast in the presence of God. Because of Him, by His doing, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from God, righteousness and sanctification and redemption, so that as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. Now when Paul writes that, he is not writing uh, with arrogance as if that didn't apply to him too. Um, Paul was a surprising choice. The Corinthians were a surprising choice. Paul was a surprising choice, right? Who was he before Jesus made him Paul? He's Saul of Tarsus, the persecutor of the church, who hates Jesus and his church and is dragging people into prison. Jesus stops him in his tracks on the road, and it came with this promise that Paul was, Saul was a chosen instrument of Christ to carry his name before Gentiles, kings, and the children of Israel. So God is a God of surprising choices on down the line. Scripture after Scripture after Scripture. And here it is again in Corinth. It's there with Paul. Why does God do it that way? Why make such surprising choices? Why choose such messy people like the Corinthians? It magnifies His mercy, doesn't it? Doesn't it magnify His grace? Paul said this, I mean, to, to bring the undeserving to himself. Paul says this about himself. He says, Though formerly I was a blasphemer, a persecutor, an insolent opponent, I received mercy because I had acted ignorantly in unbelief. I received this mercy, received mercy for this reason. That in me, here's why, as the foremost, as the chief of sinners, Jesus Christ might display His perfect patience, His long-suffering, as an example to those who were to believe in Him for eternal life. That's why God did it for Paul, and that's why He does it for us, and that's why He did it for the Corinthians. So here's Christ, shows up in a vision one night, gives Paul a couple of promises. One promise is that there's many in this city who are his people already, though they have not yet believed. The other promise there uh, is in verses 9 and 10, or the start of verse 10, that Jesus is going to be with Paul and that no one's going to attack Paul to harm him, uh, which is an amazing thing. Uh, in every other town that Paul went to, if you're familiar with his journeys, he's, he never gets to stay long anywhere. Uh, there's always persecution, opposition. There's always some violent opponent that arises and basically he's got to leave town. He can't stay for a long period of time anywhere up to this point. So, I mean, even from the beginning when he was first saved 
and went to Damascus, he started preaching Christ and people wanted to kill him there and he had to be escape the city at night in a basket. That's from the very beginning. Well, when he goes on to these missionary journeys, uh, at Iconium, there was an attempted stoning. At the city of Lystra, he was stoned and he was drug outside town and they thought they had killed him. He was left for dead. When he went to Philippi, Remember he and Silas, they're beaten with rods and then they're put in the stocks in the Philippian jail and that's when that famous story happens where they're singing at midnight. At Thessalonica, up the road, he's run out of town there. So everywhere he goes, he cannot stay anywhere for any length of time. So now Jesus appears to him and tells him, gives him this amazing promise that no one's going to attack Paul here, no one's going to harm him here. Evidently, when he came to Corinth, he was struggling with fear because verse 9 says, you know, Christ says to him, don't be afraid. Uh, I'm with you. And then when he wrote to the Corinthians in chapter 2, he said, when I came to you, brothers, I was with you in weakness and fear and much trembling. I mean, it's understandable if the guy's a little gun shy, right? Everywhere he goes, people are violently opposing him and he's getting beaten and stoned, and thrown in prison. And so Paul evidently was struggling with fear when he came to Corinth, and he needed Jesus to strengthen him. And so here's Jesus with this promise. Don't be afraid, I'm going to protect you in a unique way here. It's not going to be that way in Corinth. Paul's Paul's going to get to stay, because Christ had earmarked these sheep. He had many in the city who were already his, but they need to hear the call from the shepherd so that those that have got the ear tags in them will come into the pen. And how are they going to hear? But by a preacher. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. How are they going to hear unless there's a preacher? And so God's going to keep his preacher there so that the sheep he's already earmarked get to hear and they will, when they hear, they will believe. And they will come to Jesus. They'll come into the pen. So Christ is going to ensure the success of this plan by protecting Paul. Here's a more... Uh, uh, Highfalutin academic way to say this. God ordains the end and the means. So here's the end. Here's what God's got planned. These people in Corinth are mine. What's the means to them coming into the pen to know Jesus personally? God's going to protect his preacher Paul there in Corinth so that they hear and come in. So here's how this plays out. Look at how God fulfills this promise. Verse 11. After Christ appears to him, he stayed a year and six months teaching the word of God among them. Uh, verse 12. When Galileo, the proconsul of Achaia, was proconsul of Achaia, the, finally there does come some opposition at one point down the line. The Jews made a united attack on Paul and brought him before the tribunal, saying, This man is persuading people to worship God contrary to the law. When Paul was about to open his mouth, Galileo said to the Jews, If it were a matter of wrongdoing or vicious crime, O Jews, I'd have reason to accept your complaint. But since it's a matter of questions about words and names and your own law, see to it yourselves, I refuse to, be, refuse to be a judge of these things. And he drove them from the tribunal. Verse 18 says, After this, Paul stayed many days longer. And then he took leave of the brothers and set sail. So, because of Christ's special protection, something that had never happened before, up to this point in Paul's missionary journeys, happens. He gets to stay. He stays 18 months, then there is some opposition, but even there, there's providential protection because the Roman magistrate, the proconsul says, I'm not going to deal with, these are Jewish problems, I don't care about this stuff. And Paul stays many months longer even after that. So he gets to stay and many come to know Christ in the city of Corinth. So the Lord delivered on that. Do you know what the most surprising plan of all was? A plan that God made whose success He guaranteed and ensured. It's the plan to save people in the first place. It's the plan to send His Son to save sinners who need Him. So, we rebel against God. We want our autonomy and independence of God. We each go our own way apart from God. We rebel, and God has made a plan 
to turn us from our rebellion back to himself. And what's amazing, if you think about, I think sometimes in church we've heard this so many times, the kind of wonder and amazement gets lost on us. But think about this. In order for that to happen, there had to be a God-man. There had to be two natures united in one person in order to save people from their sins. The eternal Son of God, the Creator, who has always been the self-existent one, comes to the earth, takes on human nature, two natures, fully God, fully man, united in one person forever, and that is necessary in order to save us from our sins. Now that's an amazing thing, that's a surprising thing. A God-man, fully God, sinless, so he can pay for our sins, a man, so he can die. Born of a virgin, conceived in a virgin's womb, birthed in a barn, birthed in a stable in the middle of nowhere, raised among poor parents, not like a king in a castle, who is executed, suffering the death penalty, executed on a Roman cross like a criminal, who rises from the dead to defeat death. That is an incredibly surprising plan whose success God guaranteed. Remember the Bible says that Jesus is the Lamb Slain from when? The foundation of the world. Before the foundation of the world. Acts chapter 2, verse 23. Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God. Peter tells the Jews, you killed and crucified. You crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. So they did, they sinned, but it was... The definite plan and foreknowledge of God. God planned it. He guaranteed its success. Acts chapter 4 says, Truly in this city there were gathered together. These are the believers praying to God. Gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel, to do whatever your plan, whatever your hand and your plan had predestined to take place. So God plans some surprising things and he guarantees their success. Jesus is still calling. He's still calling sheep into his pen. Right? And the call goes something like this. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead you will be saved. For with the heart one believes and is justified, is right before God. With the heart, and with the mouth one confesses and is saved. As the scripture says, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will not be put to shame. The call goes something like this. Repent. Turn from going your own way and turn and put your trust in Christ. Whoever trusts in Jesus as their Savior, there is no condemnation for them. They will receive forgiveness of sins and eternal life. The call goes something like this. You have to get your act together to come to Jesus. You don't have to have all your ducks in a row. You're a Corinthian. You're a mess. I'm a Corinthian. I'm a mess. These Corinthians were a total mess and Jesus had them marked out. And He says, come. Confess you are a mess and trust in Jesus for your righteousness. Have you ever made a surprising plan or planned a surprise, and it was messed up by a dog. By a little white 10-pound dog. Not so with God. He makes surprising plans. He guarantees their success. So brothers and sisters, I would just call us to this. A humble one, a humble estimation of ourselves. What do we have that we didn't receive? All things are from God. Every good gift. So there's no boasting. If we received it, it's a, if it's a gift, there's no boasting. And I would call us to this too. To embrace this beautiful mission that Jesus has given us. Uh, to turn messy people into followers of Christ. To, to go as he, he's going to, 
He's going to send us to some surprising people, isn't he? We're going to find ourselves bumping into some surprising people who need Jesus, who we thought, man, I never thought I'd have a conversation with that person. That we would go, we'd be open to that, to making disciples in the power of the Holy Spirit. He's got this plan laid out, and he's got a guarantee of success, people that are his, that he's earmarked, and we have an opportunity to be a part of that. So I would just call us to that, to embrace that. So for a closing song, uh, just a song here that stresses the sovereignty of God. Um, and uh, I hope this puts the bill. I hope this works. Sovereign in the mountain air, sovereign on the ocean floor.
You are, and you alone, Lord God, are the one worthy of trust. We entrust our souls to you, our lives to you, everything. You are the sovereign one. And what a bedrock under our feet that is. Sovereign over the nations. Sovereign over salvation. The king immortal. And so we give praise to you, Lord. I, I ask that you'd help us to trust you and also um, to just rejoice, God, in, in your unfailing love and your incredible mercy. You're the God who, who plans incredibly surprising, amazing things and brings them to fulfillment. No one can thwart your plan. No one can stay your hand. And in that, we have incredible hope and confidence, God, and peace. So we just give you glory today in Jesus' name. Amen. Love you, brothers and sisters. If you need to chat, we'll be around here.